great we go good welcome everyone um my name is james wilston uh from uh the research on research institute in the uk and uh, university of sheffield from where i'm speaking to you right now uh, and it's my uh, pleasure and privilege to be moderating this uh first part of a two-part uh discussion that we're going to have on the important foundational question for a meeting like this of what is meta science um i think the original this prompt for us including this these two sessions in the agenda for this uh, this year's meeting was uh, a very interesting debate that ran in the sort of margins of the 2019 meta science meeting that uh, uh, some many of you may have may have been part of i i, I was there uh, um, at Stanford, uh, along with others, um, and, and and this debate was essentially uh, prompted by the fact that the Meta Science meeting was happening um, simultaneously uh, while the STS community was meeting. Uh, um, I think was it New Orleans? I forget now. Elsewhere in the US at that time uh, for the 4S meeting, um, and I think there was also a day of overlap or a day of two of overlap with the um, ISI meeting for the the, the society of, of uh, scientometricians of, of which. Uh, Cassidy, one of our panelists today, is the president. So there was this um, forced discussion as to, as to, well, what is this thing happening here that says it's uh, new and different in some ways from these other uh, more established communities that are, that are also meeting at the same time. And, and it prompted, prompted a, a, an important set of, ref of reflections. So we uh, are keen to dig into all of that um, in these discussions. We want to really ask, um, when we use terms like meta science, meta research, uh, science of science, or, or research on research, as in, as in my own institute, what are we actually talking about? What's new? What's uh, what's old? What's borrowed? Um, and how do these categories and terms relate to uh, both what's gone before and what uh, we're, we're all doing now? Um, and particularly, I guess, being constructive, as it were, how can we build uh, both better shared understandings of the uh, projects and priorities to which we're all directed um, and uh, uh, you know build a, a stronger shared agenda through uh, uh, these different communities while I should say not forcing everyone into the same <laughs> narrow category I don't think that's our objective at all um, so we have a fantastic panel I'm going to shut up in a moment and hand over to them uh, but I'm really pleased we've been joined um, for part one here by uh, a really good range of speakers who in their um, breadth and depth of expertise uh, reflect some of the energy and excitement that we see uh, in these debates and fields uh, right now. So we're going to hear first in a moment from Cassidy Sugimoto, uh, uh, based now at uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, Cassidy's going to be followed by Sara De Rijka, the uh, director of CWTS, the Centre for Science and Technology Studies at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Um, our third speaker will be Santo Fortunato, who's director of the Indiana uh, University Network Science Institute. Um, we're then going to hear from Aileen Fife, who is Professor of Modern History at the University of St Andrews. Um, and finally, last but by no means least, we've got uh, Charlie Ebersol, who's joining us uh, from the University of Virginia. And Charlie is uh, a postdoc research associate uh, working uh, in uh, science, better science from a, a, from a psychology uh, perspective. So you see, even in the lineup, uh, some of the uh, challenge and excitement of the task that we have. Um, we thought we would avoid big upfront talks um, and try and get a conversation going, both initially among the panel um, and also, I hope, very quickly, including uh, as many of you as possible. So please do make uh, liberal use of the uh, uh, you know chat discussion question functions um, uh, so we can pick up uh, both on, on those in, in, in the box and also maybe hear directly from some people as, as, as we get into to a discussion. Um, so I am going to ask each of the panellists to sort of opening questions, sort of get, get, get the discussion going and then we'll take it from there. Cassidy, I'm picking on you first. Uh, you wrote a very um, powerful, punchy review uh, a few months ago in Nature of uh, the book The Science of Science uh, that came out recently from, from Dash and Wang and uh, Albert Laszlo uh, Barabasi, um, and you criticised their book to some extent for, for describing the science of science as emerging without engaging sufficiently with um, its historical or interdisciplinary foundations. And I just thought 
not going into to, you know, a forensic analysis of that book in particular, whether we could take that critique, which was, as I say, expressed a bit more broadly about the meta-science field, certainly around the 2019 meeting, um, as the starting point, really, to just explore, as I say, what are we actually talking about here? What's, uh, uh, what's new? Um, and how does it relate to what's gone before? Uh, and how do we uh, navigate between areas of novelty uh, and progress um, while acknowledging uh, the foundations uh, and ongoing work in various disciplines and subdisciplines uh, on which these build? Uh, is there a middle path between hype, uh, columbusing and uh, erasure? Uh, and on the other side, seeing nothing new at all under the sun. So a bit to chew off and discuss there. Cassidy, over to you. Thanks, James. Yes, I could certainly do a, a, a week's lecture on that, but I'll try to keep it to the three to four minutes that you gave me. Um, but it's a fabulous question, right? What's new here? How does it relate to what has come before? Um, so I'll sort of start with my own conception of meta science, because I think that's important, right? The meta sciences at their heart have the primary object of study as science, science itself. And I mean that writ largely in the sort of Latin sense of sciences, right? All of these knowledge bearing kinds of activities. Um, and these fields are delineated by their epistemological and disciplinary classifications, whether it's philosophy, history, sociology, economics, psychology, or science of science, uh, which uses scientific techniques to understand the mechanisms of science. But the simplicity of these descriptions, I think, masks the complexity of nuanced political and ideological wars that have been waged in defense of certain approaches. Um, and these divisions in somewhat evoke what Andrew Abbott might call the fractal dichotomies of the meta sciences, the positivist versus the constructivist, the quantitative versus the qualitative, the theoretical versus the empirical, um, which we spend a lot of time debating. It's been argued, for example, that there's been relatively little interaction between scientometricians and SDS scholars since the late 1980s, what people commonly refer to as the quantitative and qualitative areas of the meta sciences, though I abhor that dichotomy. Um, however, like any good narrative, a protagonist is in need of an antagonist. These areas didn't develop in parallel or complete isolation, but in close interplay with one another. The citation debate, for example, can only occur when these fields are in dialogue. To juxtapose constructivist and positive narratives, the fields had to read and engage and debate with each other's work. So one might argue that the meta sciences are in the global context of science, more similar than they are dissimilar but it's in their controversies that they actually build knowledge. And this is nothing less than the accumulative model of scientific development. The bigger danger as you sort of reference is either to intentionally or unintentionally ignore the work of these other fields, what you call erasure or columbusing, but what has been referred to lately as epistemological trespassing. Um, and so to your point on the review, there's been several exclamations, not just in that book, but in several other ways, the emergence of a new field of science of science or the meta sciences. Um, and these calls try to bring attention to what they consider a nascent field, which negates decades of research on the area. And this isn't just a political stance, but one that in that eraser causes us to advance less quickly, right? It takes us back years. It brings false assumptions into the science studies in ways that are very damaging. Um, so we, we know that Derek Dazzola Price used this phrase more than 60 years ago, science of science has been around for a long time. And there's been different justifications of the emergence argument, whether it's the introduction of new data sets, however large scale data sets have been around for some time. People have said, oh, well, it's the entrance of new individuals like those from physics. But Derek Dazzola Price himself was a physicist, so that's not a very compelling argument for novelty. Um, or the term meta sciences is new. Well. Morris coined it in the 1930s, calling it an inquiry into the methodology and philosophical implications of scientific investigations, also not new. Now, some people will say the meta sciences is really focused on universal laws, and that's the new contribution. Um, but you can take a number of examples, and I'll pull from Bourdieu. In 1968, he called for the unity of the meta sciences, implying that we might be able to find agreement across scholars from all these different epistemological frameworks on the founding principles of what science is. And in this way, Bourdieu is not any different from Price, each seeking universalism, universal laws or theories to understand science, albeit from wildly different premises. So I'll sort of close with this. Is there nothing new under the sun? Perhaps not. Um, maybe that's not a problem, right? <laughs> but I'm hopeful that the biggest contribution of the contemporary era will be one of coordination 
And I want to be clear, and I think you, you sort of implied this in your opening statement, James, that coordination doesn't mean that we are in complete accord with one another. I think discord is an essential, a fundamental element in science. And I want us to be in open debates with one another. And that requires dialogue. And I think that's one of the things that's missing from some of the newer entrants to the field. The one directional conversation around the review referenced above is a stark example of that. Um, so one might question whether we can coordinate around these distinct epistemological frameworks. One might argue that constructivist work is in direct contradiction to positivist work. One cannot coordinate across those. But I think it's precisely that opposition which strengthens the field, having to defend an approach against the various alternatives to explore other ways of knowing. In this disagreement, we get closer to true understanding. So I find it not impossible to imagine a future in which scholars can move seamlessly across all the meta sciences, the sociological, the historical, the economic, um, the empirical, to have a broad understanding and deep expertise, to build teams that are representative and therefore more robust, and to interrogate current theories, develop new ones, triangulate across methods, diversify our data source. Um, and this must be done in open and constructive dialogue with one another. Um, so today's panel, I think, is a perfect example of that. So I'll sort of leave that as sort of my opening statement and turn it over to my colleagues for their comments. Brilliant. Thank you, Cassie. That's a fantastic start. I, I, it raises about a dozen questions that I'd like to ask. I'm going to resist uh, that temptation. But I mean, just to pick up on one thing, I mean, I said we weren't going to focus on that review. But as you say, you've reminded us that the, the, the constructive you know, debate, disagreement is is, is a good thing and, and, and indeed is, is one of the foundational things on which we build in any field. When you wrote that review, you must have obviously anticipated it would sort of raise a few eyebrows, spark of a debate. Did it have the, the kind of result that you thought it would or that you expected? No, the, I think the most disappointing thing is that what I heard back from that was overwhelming support. People writing, thank you for articulating what I wanted to articulate. That is my perspective too. Hundreds of people tweeting and emailing me their support of the article, but not a single response back from the authors on their reaction to it, their defense of their argument. And what I wanted to do was not to produce a punitive diatribe, but to open a conversation with that field. And that conversation never happened, not because I wasn't present for it, but because they weren't. Great. Well, we'll maybe pick up on some of that and try and have bits of that. I should say Dash and Wang, one of the authors of that book, is, is in the part two panel for this. So uh, perhaps the conversation can have it happen indirectly through that. Um, great. Thank you, Cassie. You've given us a, a very rich uh, starter to the meal ahead. And we're going to move now to uh, Sara Gareika uh, from Leiden. Um, uh, good friend and collaborator of my own. So, so it always good to see Sarah and, and debate these things with her. We certainly discussed these things uh, at length over, over a number of uh, uh, years. But, but Sarah, with colleagues at, at CWTS and, and others at Rory, you've been doing work um, uh, to try and map and navigate, make sense of uh, the meta-scientific landscape. Um, and I just wondered if you could give us a few headlines, as it were, from that kind of analysis. What can we say uh, in 2021 about um, you know, who's involved in meta-scientific work, uh, where are they working, what are they working on, um, how is that picture changing? Uh, and I suppose digging a bit deeper into that landscape map, uh, do you have a sense of what meta-science, uh, if it is one thing indeed, is trying to achieve uh, and, and who is it for? You know, who's this project, who, who does this project serve? Sarah. Thank you. Um, would you allow me to briefly respond to Cassidy and to your question? Oh. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really um, admire that you wrote that review. And I think I also agree with, uh, with some of the, the points you just made. I just want to qualify one thing, I, I think, from the... Um, the, 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 what I in interpret as some of the discomfort from parts of the STS community, um, that starts from a different starting point, I think, um, because that part is also really skeptical of the universal claims that you now ad adopt and um, um, uncomfortable, I guess, with, uh, with well, more, more negatively put, more technocratic and scientific uh, inclinations. 
Um, so when indeed James and I were, were talking about these issues, we were really thinking about, so what, what, is, what is shared and common? Because we do want to build these bridges, uh, but from the point of view of that STS community that I'm now referring to, I guess what, it's not the trespassing, but it's the fact that there's the risk of erasing and maybe um, repackaging um, interests in, in research on research. Um, that are at the interface of science, technology, and society. And the society part um, maybe sometimes disappears from view when um, we focus a lot on the more um, methodological questions or the, and it makes a lot of sense seeing where, where some of these um, concerns in parts of the meta research community come from. I will, I will talk about that later, but, um, um, reproducibility issues, of course, and and so so the concerns that that come from these disciplines, and I guess what what what's shared in those backgrounds between uh, parts of the STS community and meta research communities that you see these these scholarly identities. So they were trained in disciplines, and then they recraft these these um, identities. I think that's that's what we all do, and also build on certain commitments that you care about and engage in, um, but then maybe in slightly divergent ways as well. Um, so I wonder if, if at some point um, it would be more productive to move away from these more foundational discussions. I think it's necessary to do this right now sometimes and to push back, but also um, to look at if we can find shared, shared topics to work on and then see if we can find ways to do that from these um, different perspectives and views that we can bring. So thinking of open science, for instance, or integrity issues. Um, so I hope that is a way forward. Um, that said, I, I do think you need to push back and you did. And that's that's totally, uh, I think I totally support that. But I just wanted to, I think, uh, qualify it a little bit. Um, so yeah, so so James, indeed, we've we've been trying to get a very particular handle on on this research space. So more scientometrically, um, a huge shout out to Luda Waldman from CUGS, Helen Buckley Woods at Sheffield, and also Simon Porter at Digital Science, who actually did most of the heavy lifting. Um, so there's a lot of labels floating around, a lot of definitions. What we try to do. Um, without colonizing anything, but it's very difficult, is to use, I guess, this label of research on research, not as just another field, but, but looking at um, kind of this, this term as an umbrella term um, and to find commonalities within the pockets, for instance, of STS that, that do research on research, because I don't think all STS would qualify in the stricter sense as being research on research. It's also research on technology or, or whatever happens in society it can also be part of SCS, um, for instance. So what we did was we did a, an initial study in 2019 that was for the launch of Rory. Uh, we did a more sophisticated analysis uh, later. And, um, but already from that initial study, it was really interesting to see how we could clearly distinguish these existing and emerging academic communities involved. Um, so you have four prominent ones in the social sciences, including scientometrics and STS, innovation studies, higher education studies. And the science of science is, is more under the heading of um, the natural sciences. And then the meta science work and communities are more in the behavioral and health sciences and also parts of the social sciences. So that really triggered our curiosity. Uh, we wanted to also get gain a more deep understanding of, of how the fields and how the topics evolved. And so what we did was we looked at eight fields. So we looked at philosophy of science, history of science, STS, innovation studies, scientometrics, higher education studies, meta science, and also science of science in a period from 1950 to 2019. Um, so we looked at a couple of things. I'll just go through them very briefly and then we can open up for, for others. Um, there's a larger report coming. So um, what we first looked at was the number of publications in which uh, the field is mentioned in the title or the abstract from 1950 to uh, 2019. Uh, and what you then see is basically that around the 2000s, things really start to accelerate and 
you could you could say there's a publication boom in research on research fields. Um, first in the existing fields, such as philosophy of science, and then followed by history of science and science metrics and SCS, and a bit later, so around, yeah, maybe I would say the time in which that, that issue of fraud and reproducibility started to emerge from 2013 onwards, you also see this, this meta science community come up. And what we then looked at was every, what, what is everybody working on? Um, what we did was um, we looked at the time trend in the number of papers per research on research topic. And the topics we explored included things like innovation policy or funding or careers, impact, culture, integrity. And um, we found that, again, that this all started to boom and accelerate around the 2000s with uh, the biggest jump uh, made with the number of publications on R&D, actually, but also worth mentioning our open science and scholarly publishing research quality, research careers, which took off from the 2010s. And when we looked at the countries contributing most to each topic, we noticed that most of the research on research, research work comes from the US and Europe. Um, for example, a lot of the output on innovation policy comes from the EU or from Europe and on careers from the US. That also goes for work on integrity which surprised me a little bit, actually, because of all the framework programs in the rise in 2020 uh, on integrity and RRI, but it may be a bit soon to tell because this data goes to 2019. And um, well, finally, we looked at the representative journals of uh, the six research on research fields in the analysis that we could do that for. Um, so philosophy of science, higher education studies, innovation studies, et cetera. And in the period 2010 to 2019, the six countries that have contributed the largest number of publications are indeed the Euro Europe, the US, uh, the UK, China, Canada, and Australia. And I found it very interesting also to see confirmed, I guess, that philosophy of science is big in the US and uh, innovation studies, more European affair and STS and history of science, Europe, UK, US, and that things get a bit more distributed across the countries when we look at higher education studies. Much more to say here, um, but I'll stop here. Great, thanks, Sarah. That's that's great. That's that's really valuable. And I should say there will be a yeah the the, the study that Sarah refers to is we'd hope to have it out for today, but it's uh, it's it's almost there. It'll be coming out very soon. Um, we're moving on uh, next to uh, Santo. Um, uh, so we've heard in a sense from someone at the heart of, of Scientometrics, uh, Sarah, sort of STS, but so with a a, a foot in the Scientometric camp. Uh, Santo, obviously, through the Network Science Institute, you're, you're at the very heart of uh, one of the areas that's been most dynamic in recent years, you know, the, the application of, of network science to these kinds of questions. Uh, and I think many people would see the sort of work that, that you and colleagues in that field are doing as sort of representative of some of the most sort of exciting stuff that's going on right now. So could you give us a sense from that perspective, as it were, as to sort of both what's what's now possible and what's becoming possible sort of where you see the the direction of your piece of this uh moving feast as it were uh where, where you see it sort of having a heading over the next five to ten years and i guess also then how you you would describe and relate um the kind of work that network scientists and some of the sort of big data an analysts are doing in meta science to uh, these other dimensions of meta science that we've been touching on through through Cassidy and, and Sarah's contribution. Uh, again, a lot, sorry, these these are all multi part questions. I apologise for that, but over to you, Sato. I'm, I'm going to take thirty minutes instead of the three minutes you gave me. Uh, so first of all, thanks again for inviting me here. I appreciate very much this initiative. I wish uh, uh, there would be more in the future. Um, uh, in fact, what I was about to say, I mean, it's also uh, somehow uh, gives an opportunity also somehow to, to, to comment on uh, um, Cassidy's initial remarks as uh, I'm not an author of that book, but I'm a visible member of the community. I don't think that, uh, um, and certainly it's never been, you know, the attitude to say, you know, here we are, now we show you how to do well what you didn't do well for 50 years. I think, again, I think I feel, I know 
a lot of people in this area, especially the two who wrote that book, I know that's not the attitude. Uh, the uh, idea is that uh, we bring a bunch of computational tools and techniques that uh, um, were not so, could not be so productive, not so perhaps they didn't even exist like, uh, at the time when small data sets were available, but they make a lot of sense and they, have, uh, and they can give unique insights. Uh, when, uh, when the dimension grows, when you approach the so-called infinite limit that makes for people like me, things in fact easier than when things are small and very, you know, uh, and the scale is, is small. Uh, so uh, we have the same uh, kind of uh, discussion within network science, I mean, broadly meant, I mean, uh, when, when I say network science, I prefer to think about everybody who studies networks. So including people who started studying networks in the first half of last century, um, you know, in mathematics, we random graph theory or, social network analysis, uh, um, and, you know, more limited, of course, in the case of social network. Uh, so what's different? What's changed? Uh, I mean, okay, now, of course, we have large data sets, uh, and that's not actually our credit, no, it's just the way it is. And it's easy to get this information, it's easy to process it, and have the resources to, uh, to analyze them. Um, what changed is that the statistic, I mean, actually, it's very well exemplified by a nice figure that uh, Mark Numa, one of the Kind of the founders of modern network science shows at the beginning of some of his talks in which he shows basically a huge network in a single like you know slide and you see a lot of dots which are completely meaningless a lot of lines and so on and that don't make any sense of this you say when you had these small sociograms that people were using before and not because you know they had no choice because they were doing surveys they could also sample just a handful and like you know 20 people 30 people at the time it was difficult to get this level of information about social context you could make sense of a visualization like this, you know, because you could tell this node is important because this edge is important because this group of nodes and so on. So what changes really the statistical dimension, the fact that you can characterize classes of nodes, you have to think about classes of nodes, classes of edges, and pushing to the infinity limit, to the limit of infinite size allows us also to uh, to make sense of a bunch of phenomena that would not be visible on a small system. For instance, phase transitions, abrupt changes in the behavior. Of, uh, uh, of a network specifically. Uh, these things are not, uh, uh, we can make a lot of sense with, we, of these things, we know where they come from, we have the background of statistical physics that tell us exactly what the options are, what the behavior is, and that's also uh, powerful because it allows us to make prediction about this. Uh, I mean, of course, I know that there are not, not physicists in the audience, perhaps not so many, so I don't want to elaborate on that, but I mean, this is one of the things that we bring into the picture, you know. Uh, so analyzing large scale phenomena, you know, with the lens initial of statistical physics, but in the meantime, of course, uh, there have been a bunch of other communities, computer science has been, of course, very heavy. We provided a unique set of very powerful algorithms that didn't exist 20 years ago. It's not that they were better. There were no algorithms 20 years ago, specifically clustering algorithms uh, that now are scalable and allow us to break down a system with millions of nodes in pieces that make sense, specifically in the context of meta science. This could be groups of scientists working in the same topic, or uh, you know, group of papers uh, related to the same topic. And uh, um, at the same time, of course, you can characterize dynamical processes on that, you know, studies like uh, diffusion processes, epidemic processes, which are so uh, uh, fashionable today for obvious reasons. Um, I mean, uh, through these approaches, you can make a lot of sense. You can make, you know, uh, you, you can start from a simple model, but you can use the power of these large networks to, um, uh, to determine and sometimes even predict what's going to happen tomorrow, one week, one month from now. And uh, specifically in the context of meta science, the networks have been there for a long time, you know, 1965 science paper, the network of scientific papers by Derek de Sola Price, um, who was a physicist like me, um, experimental physicist in this case. Uh, I don't feel I'm doing anything different than what he was doing. You know, I measure the thing, I try to make sense of it with a simple model. Uh, 11 years later, he proposed this very nice paper on JCS. Uh, where he basically proposed the uh, rich gets richer phenomena applied to networks for the first time, which then was then generalized to broad class of systems. Um, and uh, and actually, I just because you know, in preparation for this meeting, I took a look at those papers again yesterday. I say how, how easily I could have done those things. I mean, easily, I mean, knowing of course what he knew and having the insight that he had. And unfortunately, I don't. It was too late anyway. Um, so I don't feel I'm doing anything different in this respect, but of course our community is broader. There are also people not from physics and uh, you know, they can use, of course, their own computational approaches. Um, so sorry, take once more. Um, so the larger the graph, basically the take home message in terms of you know, the new perspective is that the larger the graph, the easier it is to discover a simple mechanism that explain the formation of this graph. What's behind it? And that's what I'm mostly interested in because you know, we're uh, broadly interested in the same kind of questions but uh, we are, you know, 
tackle them with different approaches. Sometimes we have also different intentions. I'm more interested in the mechanism, for instance. I mean, I'm more interested like, you know, in universal laws because this is what my natural physics, uh, physics brings me to do. That does not mean uh, by any means, at least as far as I'm concerned, uh, that we don't acknowledge the complexity that you have, uh, that people are not particles, are not atoms, are not electrons, that in many contexts, these laws are not attainable, that you cannot uh, forget the characteristic of single domains and disciplines. So I'm totally aware of this. At the same time, you know, since you, we find some regularities, I would keep chasing regularities as far as I'm concerned and try to explain them with simple models, because that's what we do in other domains as well. Uh, looking forward, what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years as part of your questions? Uh, within the context of network science, I can see two interesting developments which are already going on, and I expect good news from these things in the next uh, five to 10 years. One thing is that uh, when you think about networks, uh, scientific networks, like you know, people, papers, uh, uh, ideas, I mean, uh, science is not a single network. Science is a, a complex um, organization of multiple interdependent networks. So multi-layer networks is the uh, hot topic now within network science. There's been even a book recently published by friend Ginesta Bianconi, which now summarizes the principles of this and the main techniques and problems. And I expect this to be applied more and more, also in the context, and not only, but also in the context of meta science, I will certainly do that. Um, and the other thing is um, a very promising interface between artificial intelligence and networks, specifically using graph embeddings, ways to embed, uh, so basically to turn um, networks into groups of points, which then are easier to make sense of, because then you have a continuous distribution of points, you can make a very powerful analysis there. Specifically about the possibility of um, using both uh, structural information about networks and non-structural information, like metadata or semantic information. So you have the network of papers citing each other, but you also have the abstracts of the papers, you have the titles of the papers, keywords, sometimes even the full text, and you can use both things at the same time. This is certainly new and innovative, and I expect very good stuff to come from, from this. And uh, in terms of the, you know, how I position this meta science, it's good to have a position to see you know, uh, you know, where you are, but uh, I really hope that uh, eventually, like, uh, like also Cassidy said, that we, are, we realize that they, we take almost the same questions that we may have also different goals and, and uh, most different approaches. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm a physicist, so I, I'm used to a system in which the theory dictates the experiments. In this field, I feel like I'm the experimentalist, that, but I need the theories. And the theory come from sociology and from many other fields that I don't know so well. So please explain me your theories so that I can understand better what I can measure and uh, hopefully how I can contribute to this area. Great, thanks, Santa. That's a nice constructive uh, bridge building note to, to, to end on. Thank you. That was great. Uh, lots of, again, lots of food for thought. Um, can I just remind everyone, I can see we're, we're up to a sizable number of participants, but do keep uh, popping questions into the Q&A box um, for when we get to the end of the panel, because we'll be turning to that first uh, for, for, for our source of, of Q&A. Um, moving on then, our, our next speaker uh, is uh, Aileen Fife. Um, uh, uh, from uh, University of St Andrews. Um, we've already heard a couple of references alien to uh, the history of science, philosophy of science, um, and, and those fields of course have a, a legitimate claim in a sense to be the original uh, meta-scientists, although um, uh, perhaps it's not a term that will be used in, in self-description by that many people working in, in, in HPS. Um, you, of course, in your work, what you've done on the history of peer review and other things, have, have uh, tried to make some of these links and lineages more explicit. Um, so I, I was keen to just hear your thoughts really on the uh, role, the, the contribution that uh, history of science in particular uh, is making, should be making, uh, can make to uh, meta science in this in this broader sense. Um, and, and again, your reflections as well on what some of the other speakers have said would, of course, be interesting uh, to try and join, join all this up. So, Aileen, a view from history. Thanks, James. So I've been reflecting, you know, ever since I got this invitation and since I had a little conversation on Twitter this morning and since hearing the earlier speakers, I've been thinking about disciplinary identities and about changing disciplinary identities. It's something that in the history of science, I think we've wrestled with now for the best part of 100 years. I do belong to a discipline that I think we now think is a discipline, but maybe wasn't at various points in time. But I should say I was trained in history and philosophy of science. I have since worked in a history department. I still work in a history department, but I still see myself as a historian of science. And in my brain, historian of science is a thing. 
exactly what it means is you know, another question. But I was trained in that HPS tradition and HPS itself has gone through various disciplinary changes as fewer and fewer people do the H and the P part of it, but just do one part of it or other. And the fact that in the UK, we see a lot of historians of science who are like me working in history departments, not in HPS departments, or we see historians of science working in sociology and technology studies departments, perhaps, or in HSTM units, we've got so many acronyms floating around, so history of science, technology and medicine unit. It's not that common to see history and philosophy of science done together anymore, which is why there's a campaign to bring them back and have integrated HPS. So I think of all these debates, but I don't think it changes my concept that there is a, a, a coherent field that we call history of science, that we, we recognize that's a shortcut because our vision of what that science thing is, is now much, much broader um, than anything that the people 100 years ago would have imagined by science. We have people in the field of history of science who are studying technology, medicine, maths. We have some who are studying things that aren't natural sciences at all, but are more other forms of scholarly endeavor. We also have people who are studying uh, practices from other parts of the world, which aren't at all like the Anglo-American vision of science, but they are certainly forms of knowledge. We have people who are interested in, in the knowledge of different cultural groups, different people in the world now, different people in the world in the past, much of which wouldn't have been labeled science if we understand it as modern science, but is surely a way of understanding the natural world and a way of gaining knowledge. So history of science covers all of that. And so it's clear to me, in my head that history of science can contribute to this thing called research and research or meta science or whatever we're calling it. But I've been quite, but certainly not everybody. And I've been quite interested by recent discussions as to whether we should be renaming the history of science. Uh, should we call it history of knowledge? Certainly for some of my European colleagues who are working in a different language set from English and debating how to translate words like Wissenschaft into English. The history of knowledge seems quite an attractive term but it does mean something different from what history of science has traditionally meant. But it can go in at least two different ways. Some of my colleagues are seeing that as a way of thinking about not just academic knowledge, but also um, craft, trade, industrial knowledge, um, which maybe doesn't come into the ROR thing so much. But others would see it as a way of moving beyond the natural sciences and including the history of humanistic scholarship and social science scholarship, not just natural scientific scholarship. All of these are debates that we've been having for decades, if not more than decades, in the field we might broadly call the history of science. Um, it strikes me that in my context in the United Kingdom, most, though not all, historians of science are working primarily in a history setting. They're, we're probably sociologically influenced in that we're interested in people and practices and communities. Um, whereas, for, for instance, our predecessor 100 years ago were more interested in ideas and concepts and hypotheses and the content of science, there is a lot more interest now in the practices, the communities, the people. Um, and that should all fit quite nicely to a meta science or research and research um, focus. But I was then reflecting, James, and you asked me, was I, you said I was unusual in making these linkages. I was thinking, is that true? And if it's true, why is it true? I mean, here, here's my attempt at an answer is that it, when I trained in HPS, one of the things we were warned off very early on was this thing called Whiggism or Whiggish views of, of history and of science and the, to be the dangers of present-centered history. In other words, we were warned to be really, really careful about assuming that the way science is done now is the best, the right way, the inevitable way. So when we look at our historical case studies, when we do our field work in the historical times, we mustn't look at those and think, oh, they're really poor versions of what we know is going to come later. Or we shouldn't look at them and think, oh, well, it's, a, it's an early phase of development for something that's going to get much better later on. The important thing is to look at them in their own context, to understand them in their own light, in their own time and place. I think that was a very good insight to have drilled into us, that we should consider things in their own historical context, time, place. However, it does strike me that it's made us quite wary of telling the bigger narrative and of connecting things to the present. I'm still uncomfortable whether some of my research would be labelled present-centred history. 
because of the fact that I'm working on things like the history of peer review or the history of scholarly publishing. Part of the reason I'm doing that is because these are topics of current concern, and I think it would be interesting to know more about their history. So is that present centered? I would say not. The questions are present, are determined by present interests, but when I study them historically, I am still looking at them, um, I hope, through a historical lens and not a present centered one. But you know, the fact that I feel that slight uncomfortableness, I think tells you something about why there can, must be lots of other historians of science out there who are also not quite comfortable about moving out of the history part and starting to relate it to the present, which is what we might be thinking about, I guess, when we're doing um, research on research in the current times. I think that what changed for me was doing a project on the, as many of you will know, the history of Royal Society publishing that had to start at the beginning in 1665, but also came right up to the present. So many history of science studies look at a particular relatively small point in time. Perhaps too much in isolation from the things before and after it, but, but really for anyone who works before the 20th century, we don't tend to connect up to the present, but I was forced to do so in the work I've been doing on peer review and scholarly publishing. And that made me realize how valuable it actually is to do that, not just to say things were different in the past, but to be able to say things were different in the past and look at how they change until we ended up where we are. Because one of the things I've really come to realize is how the, the, the modern academic practices, scientific practices that we use, they didn't come from nowhere. They weren't created for us now. They have historical development, evolution, whatever word you want to use. And we can still see the marks of that historical development in the practices that we're using now, whether it's um, the natural sciences using single blind peer review and the human humanities using double blind, that's got historical reason behind it, for instance. And there are many other examples of that. And our different academic communities, our different disciplines, they have evolved and developed differently, or even the same discipline in different countries have evolved different practices and different habits. And it's the history that helps us understand that and helps us understand why I don't personally think we should be looking for universalist laws about how science or academia or research works. I think there's far more variation and part of that is historically determined. Um, but for me, I've really come to value that use of history to explain how we got to where we are. I hope not in a bad present centered way, but as a way to try and understand why we do things the way we do. And I think that also helps us to think about if we're trying to make changes, as some of us might be campaigning for, of the things that we do the way we do, which ones of those are necessary or good or valuable or effective? And which ones do we do just because it's the way they've been done for the last 150 years? And actually the way they were created back then was for contexts and situations that actually don't apply anymore. And there's really no good reason to keep doing them that way if we can think of a different way that would be more suited to our bigger, more diverse, et cetera, community nowadays. So I think history helps us understand that um, and helps us reflect on, yeah, I say why we do it the way we do and whether perhaps we should still be doing it given that we live in a different context from where many of these practices started. I'll stop there. <laughs> great, thank you, Aileen, that's, that's great. And uh, yeah, very interesting, I must say, I mean, we were saying about the Royal Society and doing the work on publishing there, sort of bringing this stuff to the surface, having having worked, as you know, at the Royal Society myself for a few years. I mean, it is a very unique institution and environment for making very tangible those threads that connect, uh, you know, the origins of, of, of modern science, or, or at least part of those origins, in, you know, uh, in the 17th century through to, through to the present day, quite, quite <laughs> remarkably so, and un unlike uh, certainly anywhere else I've uh, uh, worked. But thanks, that was great, really interesting and, 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 and valuable, I think, to, to bring that more visible strand of, of historical reflection into, into the discussion. Interesting as well, your thoughts on sort of HPS and, 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 and that debate. We may come back to that in our wider discussion. Um, but we're going to turn now to our final contribution. Um, uh, Charlie Ebersol is uh, talking to us uh, from uh, Virginia. And uh, Charlie, we wanted you to, to kind of come in uh, uh, at this point and give us a, a sort of view from within um, the meta-scientific ranks of psychology as, as a representative not only of, of, of that discipline diverse as psychology is but of of this wider sort of phenomenon in meta-science which is that that you know we've been talking so far as it were from different 
disciplinary starting points looking in on the the science system but a lot of the impetus a lot of the real energy in these debates in recent years has actually come from uh, other disciplines trying to solve problems in their own backyards whether it's the you know problems over reproducibility or, or, or uh, problems over equality diversity all sorts of things that different disciplinary communities have um, uh, become much more engaged and, and energized in tackling and uh, have then turned to uh, meta scientific methods and techniques to help uh, provide the evidence to then support the, the 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 change that they would like to see. So I thought you you could perhaps uh, uh, maybe unfairly embody psychology's journey through that over the past sort of decade or so, but also maybe reflect a bit more broadly on on that phenomenon in other adjacent disciplines because I think it's a very important part of the mix. Over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean the i don't want to like you know get too much into my own personal history because i i imagine that is of, of of limited value but like yeah the the in many ways i think how i stumbled into this area of research is is similar to a broader conversation that my my own kind of academic home or field of social psychology was having um which was that uh over the last decade we've kind of looked a little bit uh probably harder at ourselves and thought eh, you know maybe there are some things that we can be doing better maybe we're not we're not producing and knowledge and understanding as efficiently and reliably as we could um and that's where it started for me it was well you know social psychology seems cool uh i have chosen to pursue grad school in it i would like us to to do it in a way that we continue to learn cool stuff uh how can we do that better or get there faster. Um, and we didn't call it meta science. It was just like, oh, well, you know, if we're trying to study studies, let's study studies. Um, and that was purely the the impetus for it. You know, since then it's it's been really exciting to tap into all of these, these um, you know, broader literatures and see all of the things that people have been thinking about and talking about for much longer than, you know, I have been alive let alone doing you know academic research um but but yeah i think the the genesis within at least social psychology has been a very problems focused one there are issues that we saw within our own field that some of us wanted to try and get a better handle on largely with the 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 goal of being able to make recommendations on how we might do better um I think earlier in my you know, meta science research, I would have hoped that some of the things that we glean from meta science and social psychology would be more broadly applicable to like science writ large. Uh, that's something that I continue to be more humble about as I meet and talk to other scientists. But you know, I think I think it's still been useful to even if it's as narrow as like, oh, okay, there's there's meta science if that's what you want to you know call it if that's a useful label within psychology that can help psychologists understand how they do psych research and, and maybe help us do it a bit better, that that seems useful to the extent that those lessons uh, generalize to other fields of inquiry, like that's awesome. If they don't, they're just useful in a, in a more limited sense. Um, but I think that that kind of problem focus uh, as kind of the genesis of, of research on research and psychology has been a big determinant of how we've we've gone about it um and as as nice as it might be for helping us come up with practical knowledge there's there's definitely some downsides in terms of maybe we're not looking enough at the the bigger picture and that's something that i i definitely uh, had way more confidence about earlier in my, my meta science career than i should have and do now Great, thanks, Charlie. That's 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 great. Really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, good. So we're going to move into discussion. We've got uh, uh, forty minutes or so for uh, discussion, both amongst the panel, uh, and we started to hear bits of that as as people reacted uh, earlier on to, to different contributions, and through the Q and A box, which I'm pleased to say is now uh, uh, not quite filling up, but at least it's they're trickling in, uh, which is which is great. Um, so we'll maybe pick a couple of those to start off and 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 uh as i say do also fellow panelists of use use this as a chance to 
link the conversation across across the group because I think there's lots of threads here that we could try uh, and, and and weave together in an interesting way. Um, I'm going to pick the, the the one that's just come in from from Oliver Saal uh, as, as a starting question. Oliver asks, how does the panel believe metascientific research should relate to the boundaries of disciplines? So when we've been you know, nibbling away at this, obviously, from different perspectives through this panel, um, he's saying there's a risk of needlessly, he's suggesting there's a risk of needlessly reifying those boundaries through field specific meta research. Um, on the other hand, as uh, Aileen mentioned, the disciplines have their own histories and might merit their own focused research. Uh, so in terms of the meta scientific project, he's saying, should, you know, should we have meta sciences of biology, of physics, of, you know, psychology, et cetera, et cetera, or try and deal with this in a more um, holistic, synthetic way? Who would like to offer a thought on that? I'm going to go back to Cassidy, who has put a hand up. Thanks, Cassidy. Sure, because I think this this comes to the, the unity question, and I want to push back against Sarah's comment, because I think I've been mischaracterized as um, implying that I believe in a single universal law defining all science, which I absolutely do not. So I apologize if I implied that I was representing Bourdieu and challenging the assumption that the notion of unity or the notion of universal laws is new, which, which it's certainly not. Um, and, and I'll get to this, this question in a second, but I want to kind of go on that and push on the idea that SDS scholars reject universal theories. I think that there are several foundational perspectives that SDS scholars adopt, and that is part of those boundaries of disciplines, right? When we think about what defines a discipline, it is a shared understanding of those principles. That is part of what makes something an epistemological construction. And so I, I would reject, we might call them different things, right? Universal laws evokes a very quantitative thing, whereas theories evoke something a little more conceptual and less empirical, but they're the same sorts of items. We're thinking about the foundational principles. So um, to the question, what I mean when I'm thinking about unity and what's possible is taking some of these things where we start to align. So um, stratification, I think is a really interesting one. I think if you talk to any sociologist, they believe in stratification. They've observed stratification using their theories. You look at um, complex system studies, network science has observed stratification, right? We've observed stratification in history, we've understood it. And so it is trying to look at some of these different issues from all of these lenses to be able to understand them, to understand why they've happened, when they've happened, how they've happened, answering all of those different frameworks. That's what I think is the importance of unity. To do that, you have to have strong disciplinary training. You have to be able to bring your disciplinary knowledge and tools to that conversation. And then you have to find the places of misalignment. And I think that's what's interesting. Why would we come and sociologists present one view of this thing and a network scientist presents another view? What's, what's missing in the gaps? What's there? What can we know? Those are the interesting questions to me. So when I talk about this unity, it's really that coordination, that collaboration, that exchange of ideas and knowledge so that we find the areas of overlap, but also find the areas of discord, um, which means that you know, a reification of disciplinary boundaries is perhaps going a little too strong. I think we should, you know, stay trained in our disciplines, understand our disciplines, but also increase the permeability between those. Thanks, Cassidy. Any, anyone else want to come in on, on, on that? Uh, Aileen, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm coming, I'll answer this question from the point of view of someone who is working in a history department, a humanities department, not a science department, because in, there's a lot of concern, I think, in the humanities departments that attempts to use this kind of research to change policy, for instance, whether that's introducing open science or concerns about replicability or about research integrity or any of that, a lot of that is driven by the needs of the biomedical sciences. And then we can discuss whether all the natural sciences share some things, but when we move over to things like history, philosophy, English, French literature, all the rest of it, then we find it a lot more difficult as practitioners of those fields to say that some of the things that are being, that we're being encouraged to think about have anything to do with the research practice that we follow. And so I'm really interested in the question of how, how many values and norms academics as a whole do share. I think, you know, I, I, I agree with Cassidy about the, our disciplinary training. It, we, we're trained to do things in certain ways and to believe that this is the right way to do things and these are the right approaches to take. And they, they are different. 
from each other. And therefore, I find it quite difficult to deal with ideas that suggest that, well, well really, policy change is realistically is what we're talking about. Policy change that seem to be designed for all academics, but are really just designed for some. And one of the things I like to think that this kind of meta science or research and research can do is point out why, why there's a lot more variation between disciplines that we need to understand properly so that we don't just take a one size fits all policy and that then doesn't actually fit all. Great, thanks. I think we'll, we'll, that, that, that's good. Let, let's take a, a second question because uh, these, these build and connect. Um, Annette, uh, Annette Bramley has asked uh, a very good question for us. Uh, how would the panel answer the so what question um if science of science meta science is important how can we use this knowledge uh, better outside um the the primarily academic discussions that we're having here around meta science um to improve how we carry out research more broadly and engage with with, with others um so i mean this is of course you know we're having a conversation here about disciplines and categories within the within the the academy i'm very conscious of that but uh, a very important feature of many aspects of the scientific community is it, its attempt to uh, or people's attempt to as we've been touching on at points actually improve uh the way research systems cultures uh operate run uh how do we kind of better connect all of this to practice and, and change the systems that we're analyzing charlie yeah i'll i'll take a first stab at this um because we've gotten to see a little bit up close the, the the parallels. So in the time since uh, James, I think you were sent my you know my contact info. I have started as a researcher at um, the American Institutes for Research, which is a nonpartisan think tank based here in the U.S. I work on education policy, um, and it's you know we we have different groups, different categories, different objectives, and the like. Um, you know, outside of the academy, and yeah, I I think my my first and more obvious answer is send people with this training and background and experience outside the academy. Um, I think there are things that are useful for that I have learned in trying to do meta scientific research. I think there are useful perspectives that you gain identifying with that field and engaging with other people who identify with that field. And, uh, you know, some of them are useful out. Uh, in the uh, the more natural world, I guess, in terms of much more applied uh, research with with folks out in the field. Um, so, I mean, that would be probably my biggest advice is, uh, you know, there are lots of us. I'm glad there are lots of us that identify with it. I think what we're doing is useful and not just among us. Uh, go and have contact with broader interdisciplinary teams, not only in terms of like, what was their PhD in, but what are the problems they're actually trying to solve and how did these lessons make it easier to solve those problems? Great, thanks, Charlie. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great point. Um, Sara, you wanted to come in. Yeah, thanks, James, and also excellent question. Um, yeah, so, so it also taps back into what Anine was just saying about the relationship with policy, because I think there's one space in which there's a lot to do uh, for us and we are already doing that and engaging and are implicated in, in that, that kind of process uh, as, as research on researchers, or however we want to call ourselves. Um, um, so policy, uh, funders, publishers, researchers themselves, uh, but maybe also more societal actors outside of the, the, the immediate ecosystem of, uh, of uh, Higher education and research, but but to but to to stay there. So outside of our our, our fields, I think um, we can do and mean a lot and have meaningful engagement. Uh, for instance, when you consider that funders and policymakers and also publishers and uh, the ways in which peer review works. So that kind of um, work sets boundaries for what can be researched in the first place and what can be known in the first place and who's allowed to know and and communicate and uh and set set uh, set policies and and so by studying those uh, and analyzing those practices and also engaging um with policymakers and funders and publishers and other researchers i think uh, we can make a meaningful meaningful difference also by for instance discussing um 
well, well uh, reproducibility is an example I know close from, from, from close by because uh, we've had discussion about how, how is that relevant in all fields and what does that mean in all fields? Should we use the word? And that can result in more, um, maybe more subtle policies or, or slightly different uh, funding schemes that also allow for different interdisciplinary engagement and that has effects in the world as well. Great, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. That, that's great. Um, Santo. Yeah, uh, just very briefly, and uh, of course, I agree with what I heard so far. I mean, uh, uh, we study science as a system, um, you know, of course, various aspects of it. And by understanding it better, eventually, we uh, we also learn how we can make it better, you know, as a researcher, you know, even not doing these things before, because for so many years I haven't, you know, I was a particle physicist and then a statistical physicist before doing things that were more interdisciplinary. I would like to know how we can, you know, uh, maximize my, inter my, my impact by interacting better with my peers, by, um, you know, uh, being subjected to fair procedures or evaluation, you know, when, I don't know, discussion about promotions, you know, and other things, hiring come into place. So uh, overall, I mean, this is the kind of spin-off we, we hope to generate, at least, I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, policy is not, uh, no, it's not my main focus. Like I say, my understanding is, again, you know, to, uh, to study science, like, you know, we study the universe in many ways, um, uh, but in this case, there is an obvious implication which affects any scientist, you know, any, any actor of this, any part of this system, uh, whereas, you know, you are, you are a scientist or somebody who has a value science or, you know, uh, disseminate science, fund science. Great, thanks, Santo. Um, I wanted to move on. Uh, another good question sort of links a bit to this. Um, Heather Douglas, uh, the philosopher, uh, um, has uh, posed a good question for us. Given that uh, humans are indeed not particles and will respond to results from uh, research on research, um, how do we, you, uh, as uh, members of the meta scientific community, think about the ethical issues of framing uh, which questions you ask? And pursue in 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 this research, and, and perhaps one could add to that: which questions don't get asked? Because in some ways, that's uh, uh, always uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, follow-on to, to, to the other questions. So, yeah, how do we think about the, the sort of ethics of of what we? And it goes back a bit to the earlier point I asked about, you know, who is this sort of who, who is meta science for, as it were? Um, I think uh, Sarah touched a bit on this in her, her response about the, the public and, and society, but anyone else want to uh, come in on that? Sure, I'll, I'll say a, a few words on this. And, you know, this question really resonates with me and is something that I, I struggle with in my own research as well. Um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting what Sarah said about for whom and by whom is knowledge constructed is something that guides a lot of my research. So I work through these questions trying to understand um, who gets to participate in science, whose work is valued and received and rewarded, how do our reward structures incentivize certain populations um, and disadvantage other populations. But in doing that, because of the crudeness of the tools that I use, I recognize that I reify many problematic classifications, the gender binary, for example, the racial classifications in the US as another one. Um, Eileen talked about sort of disciplinary constructs as well. We are constantly as meta scientists creating notions of what constitutes a community of scholars, what constitutes a truth area, and Eileen brought up different ways of knowing, not just from Wissenschaft, but moving beyond that to indigenous knowledge, other forms of knowing. And in every study we do, we exclude that. When we use a bibliometric database, we're making very explicit exclusionary practices that are happening that saying, this is what truth is, this is what constitutes knowledge, and this is who made it, um, when we know that those are really problematic. So um, this is something that, that I wrestle with, of, so taking the best tools available to me right now to try to move forward on some of these policies, which I think are really important policies to improve science and thereby society, um, but also understanding that these tools are crude and that they are problematic and we need to interrogate them and improve them, not to destroy them completely, because I think we shouldn't imagine a, 
a mythical past that before we were measuring this, everything was better, right? It, it wasn't better in the past, right? So we need to move on to say what we're doing definitely has ethical implications. It has ethical consequences. And if we are not fully aware of those and engaged in those conversations as we move forward in our research, we have the um, potential to for some serious misconduct. Thanks, Kirsty. Anyone else want to come in on 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 that point, Charlie? Yeah. Yeah. No. I, it's it's a fantastic question and one that I'm really uncomfortable with. So I, uh, you know, a lot of the meta science that that at least I got to be a part of in psychology were in the form of these big uh, crowdsource replication projects. We're bringing in teams of researchers from all over and all of their time and all of their resources and the like to contribute to, to a larger project to try and understand how studies in psychology work. Um, and I feel really fortunate that I got to be a part of those efforts and lead some of those efforts. But I, I also think that who gets to do those and how those shapes the question, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, a large part of the reason that I was able to you know, build teams to do these projects is because my advisor in grad school has a lot of Twitter followers and he would tweet out my stuff, you know, and like not everyone has access to Brian's Twitter. And like that, that's in many ways, that's a horrible way to decide a research paradigm, right? Like this area should, I should not have an outsized influence on what kind of studies get to be done in that space with that level of resources, because if, you know, people are limited by what I can come up with, like they're in trouble. That's insanely limited. Um, I think the a model like the Psychological Science Accelerator, which I, I was fortunate to, to work on a lot, um, is, is a good way to maybe tackle some of these questions, some of these more ethical dilemmas in terms of high resource uh, meta science. Um, in that they, it's a you know, it's a large network with democratically elected leadership. They select projects to pursue and how to devote resources through democratic consensus. Um, I think that's a better way because uh, I'd like to think that bringing more minds in these fields to the, the problems produces better outcomes. Um, but yeah, to the extent that meta science is a particularly research intensive or a resource intensive field of inquiry, I would as much as we can try and make collective decisions rather than leaving it up to like what some schmuck at UVA feels like doing. You know, that's, that's a pretty bad way to organize the field. Thanks, Charlie, great. Um, moving on, I had a question from Megan Higgs uh, about, um, uh, I guess, kind of policing our own field or at least sort of preserving, maintaining the, 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 the standards and, and, and quality that we would uh, often demand of others. Um, she asked, when carrying out meta-science research, how can we avoid inadvertently falling into some of the same traps uh, that lead to the problems we've identified in that, in that meta-scientific research? So, uh, for example, misuse of statistical methods and concepts uh, happens within meta-science research, even when studying problems, uh, you know, with those same uh, statistical methods. I guess another way of framing this might be the sort of John Ioannidis question with respect to COVID and how someone who was... Uh, obviously a sort of giant in some ways of meta research ends up being embroiled in a in a uh, a, a, a very sort of heated and, and debatable uh, uh set of of uh discussions around covid data but uh, uh maybe that's unfair on john to pick on it but it you know that clearly is a is a, a question for the field particularly when someone that prominent gets uh, uh, uh dragged into something like that any thoughts on on that um, Santo, do you have any, I mean, I guess how we sort of live up to. So basically the question is that, I mean, how, I mean, that I shouldn't use the, the same techniques that I'm uh, studying, basically, at the time criticizing, at the time trying to. Yeah, I guess, how do we avoid falling into some of the same pitfalls that, that underpin the, the starting point for the analysis, as it were, the, the more critical analysis? I don't know. I mean, um, of course, I mean, I know there are big uh, uh, discussions about um, p-values, for instance, recently, I think there is even a question on that. Um, 
I mean, I would say for, uh, and of course I speak in this case on, on behalf of, uh, of those that use some of the tools that I use. Um, I mean, we don't really, uh, I mean, of course we discuss about things like significance and, uh, and of course we use when we, when we need it, you know, we use also p-values, but I don't really see, um, I don't think that this is really a big problem when you try to do the, the type of analysis that we do. I mean, that, I mean, I understand that this could, I mean, statistics, I mean, I understand that if you have heavily engaged in statistical uh, analysis, I mean, statistical, like really use statistics, you know, inference, especially, there could be issues like that. And then of course, occasionally I use the tools myself and, uh, uh, I mean, I try somehow not to, uh, I mean, to avoid this conflict, so to speak, uh, by not uh, try to investigate some of the practices that are uh, uh, somehow uh, not really steady or, you know, uh, somehow not, uh, not sufficiently established or criticized or definitely improvable. I don't see this kind of conflict in my, my, in my own studies, but uh, yeah. I mean, Charlie, do you, I mean, have you sort of grappled with this at all coming? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the obvious answer is we, we form the field of meta meta science so that we can all keep <laughs> writing papers on something that we say is new. Um, but no, it's, it's really tough. Right. And it, I, I think the main thing that, you know, I would, emphasizes the extent to which we kind of get a little bit too tunnel visioned on particular parts of the process. So I, I'd say at least the meta science that I've been involved with in psychology, we absolutely have the opportunity to engage in a lot of the practices that we think are potentially suboptimal based on our research. Um, we pick some of those things to study uh, as we learn that, hey, maybe, you know, we can do things in a more rigorous or efficient way. We're probably more likely to do them. There's certainly some social pressure there. Like, uh, you know, it would it would be bad to uh, publish a like p hacked paper on why p hacking is bad. Someone's probably going to see that and point it out. So, you know, there's some internal pressure there. Um, I think the harder thing is not getting too wrapped around the axle for a given topic. Um, so within, you know, I'll just again, go from psychology. There's been a lot of emphasis on reforming and better understanding the consequences for how we use frequentist statistics and, and run our models. Like that's good. I think we can get better there. I think we've learned some useful things. Uh, there's other stuff that we're probably not doing as well. The one that comes to mind is, is measurement. We should spend a lot more time, I think, in, in a lot of psych subdisciplines on developing better and more valid measures. Uh, and the extent to which I'm spending all my time thinking about, you know, how should I be better at pre-registering studies if that takes away time from thinking about those other elements that could weaken the work. Um, again, that's why I would point to, you know, a potential way forward is larger uh, sustained networks of labs like the Psych Science Accelerator, where, you know, we have lots of content experts that each take pieces of projects to try and look over. Uh, turns out there's a lot of really smart people out there that work on research. Uh, and one of the big struggles is getting them to all talk to each other. But, you know, if you can create networks where they do that, and we can really leverage people's individual expertise, I think it fights against that. But yeah, like we've, we've got the same problems that we we, we seek to study uh, and trying to be vigilant for that's an ever an ongoing struggle. Great, thanks, Charlie. And um, we've got a few more questions coming in, but while we we let people type a few more in, let, let me just sort of ask a broader question, I guess, to the panel, picking up uh, some of the points that were made at the start by Cassidy and, and, and also touched on by, by Sarah. Um, the, the sort of institutionalization of this field, if one can call it a field, uh, is a very interesting question and perhaps I mean, lies at the root, or at least the, 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 as ever, in, in certainly in academia, the, the battle for resources status, uh, the policing of, of different disciplinary and, and sort of epistemological boundaries lies at the root of a lot of the, 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 the tussling that I guess goes on. And I just wondered if, if any or all of you had thoughts on uh, sort of where meta science goes from here, as it were, in terms of its development as uh, as a project, as a set of, of, of activities that are, of course, very widely distributed across, um, certainly across the, the university research system, um, such that it doesn't necessarily seem obvious to me, at least, that the solution is 
uh, you know, the creation of a department of meta science. Uh, uh, that that would seem one of this to be the, the, the opposite of what's required. Um, so just sort of interested in, in people's thoughts on that and also inevitably the thoughts about funding and money. I mean, Cassidy in particular, you've, uh, you know, not that long ago come off your 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 tour of duty in the, in the National Science Foundation, uh, you know, uh, uh, coordinating the, the, the what was the CISIT program, now the Science of Science program. So particularly interested in your thoughts from that experience, but others as well. We've all got experiences, good and bad, of the, the, the ease or difficulty of getting uh, the resources to do the kind of work that we're talking about here. So, uh, so yeah, two big questions, institutions and money. Any thoughts? Cassidy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think institutionalization in some ways is an organic progress that communities of scholars follow through. They institutionalize around conferences and then journals, and then eventually it's degree granting programs and they move towards those levels of institutionalization. Um, why? And I think you pointed out a huge reason because of resource allocation, right? Institutionalization is an easier avenue for resource allocation than sort of distributed umbrella horizontal kinds of activities. Um, so there is something to being a vertical unit that makes it easier to address those. Um, I was fortunate, and I think the, the US um, meta science community is fortunate that there is a funding agency devoted um, to funding this area of research, and that gives them a home. Otherwise, um, most meta scientists would have to try to fit into homes that really um, weren't aligned with them, be reviewed by panelists who don't understand them. So bringing them together in that way was really important. And what I valued there is each one of our panels had all the same kinds of representation that we see on this panel today so that people could look at something and say, I'm going to look at the proposal from a sociologist on the grounds of sociology rather than economics. I'm going to look at the economics proposal from an you know, economic perspective when I'm doing that evaluation. So because you had a diverse body, they were able to represent the meta sciences really well. And I, I think that that's important. But Eileen brought a really important point into this conversation about that institutionalization. It's not that we've just not institutionalized departments of meta science, but we've moved away from the few examples that we have of an HPS department. Indiana is lucky to have an HPS department that sort of brings those together. But most people doing meta sciences are all over the place. Santos in an informatics program. I'm in a school of public policy. Eileen's in a history department, right? So that's part of the nature of our field. And I think that that's part of that difficulty is that we'll have to look to institutionalization, um, which leads to that resource allocation in very different ways. Coming together as a community will be necessary for that, um, but it may not be in the same mechanisms of other processes of institutionalization. And yeah, that's a great point, Cassidy, uh, in terms of, of, of the departmental. I mean, just to, to reflect briefly, from a UK perspective, I mean, historically, the big centers of, of research in this area, Sussex with Sprue, um, Manchester, um, were all swallowed up as it were by uh, business, uh, yeah, you know, business schools, because that was where the money was. Uh, and of course that then drags the center of gravity into uh, innovation studies, which of course is an important part of the, the, the mix, but not the totality of it. So that's another uh, uh, interesting. And, and if I, if I may, before we go over to Sarah, is, is also then that changes the evaluation practices for those individual scholars. When you move into a business school, you're now subject to business school accreditation requirements, which means business school publishing requirements, which means the way you frame your questions, the kinds of collaborations that you pursue is going to be um, constrained by those disciplines. So that institutionalization actually matters for the kind of knowledge that you can produce and that you will produce. Um, so that is a, a I think a concern that we have to think about just in those evaluation structures, whether it's the macro level ref type structures or the individual PNT structures that are going to have influence on the kind of scholarship that comes out of the meta sciences because we lack departmental homes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good point. Um, Sarah. Yeah, fully agree with uh, all that Cassidy just said. Um, we are in the process in the Netherlands of um, uh, together with funders trying to carve out this space a bit, bit more, also to help them understand, um, uh, better understand what, what this can be. And they, so they see that there's something uh, going on in this space, and, um, but they're literally not sure if it, what it is and how it's dispersed. It's in these, for all these reasons you just mentioned, it's an issue. Um, so lack of institutionalization in a sense. Um, 
I, I was also wondering um, about institutionalization and doing that uh, with a critical eye uh, and, and taking on board uh, some of the stuff that, that, that we know indeed from evaluation or what we what we know about open science and how to do open science and open infrastructures or open knowledge knowledge infrastructures. Would we then indeed start to launch new journals? For what purpose would we indeed do that? Um, so, so those types of systems indeed have some purchase for all the reasons you just mentioned, but I also see some clashes with, uh, with other value systems that, 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 that we also engage with in the meta research or research on research SCS communities. Uh, around openness, for instance. So I I'm really curious also to see and maybe discuss further how we think about and how we will productively engage with institutionalization processes together. Thanks, sorry, yeah, that, that's great. Um, Aileen, uh, over to you. Sure, just find my mute button now. Um, I, I'm, you see, I don't think I would want to join a department of meta science if there was one, because I, mean, I was initially I was thinking it's the problem here is like other interdisciplinary fields that we've seen in the past um women's studies um possibly political science going further back book history is one I know um which have eventually taken on the institutional forms that Cassidy was talking about a moment ago and I was thinking I my areas of interest are not if we're doing Venn diagrams they overlap with meta science but they're not entirely um described by meta science and for all those points that Sarah's just made about what, what sort of publishing practices one might, or one of you just made, publishing practices, norms of evaluation, I think I'd be happier staying in a history or history science structure where the way I work is understood and, and valued. What I'm looking for, I think, is ways to have the conversations and the communication and the working together on a shared problem with people from different backgrounds. I, I want structures to do that. But I'm not sure that's the same as wanting university institutional structures that would I don't know, undermine or cut across my, my disciplinary um, identity. Um, so I, I'm you know, musing on that, listening to you. Um, am I allowed to ask a question of my other panelists while I'm here, James? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was thinking of something that Sarah said a while back when she was talking about the literature review of where meta science is being done and in what disciplines. Um, and I think you said that it's mostly a, a North America, Europe um, phenomenon, this interest in the research and research and science of science, whatever you want to be. But one of the things I've been musing on is, is it culturally imperialistic of us in Europe, North America, to set about studying how the science, the research that's done in mostly Europe, North America is done, should be done, and expecting the rest of the world to follow suit? Or are we just not recognizing different ways of creating knowledge and respecting that? It just sounds a little bit like a version of, let's all look at the um, Scopus and Web of Science database and assume that's everything that there is in science, which we know is not true for a whole host of different reasons. Um, so how do we avoid that in this new field, if I'm remembering what Sarah said correctly, admittedly? Yeah, no, yeah. that is <laughs> Sarah, you want to respond to that? I guess I, I also couldn't really do justice to the subtleties of the analysis, but I also think you have a point um, that, of course, we, we now um, reify some of the issues that the point that Cassidy made basically about uh, what you start with, what you start out with, the, the types of data you start out with. And um, um, the, the type of classifications you use and you come up with partly yourself, but also um, using the classification exercise uh, that leads towards uh, these end results. And I think it's a really important point. And um, also, I think really a lot of discussion goes around into considering what openness, for instance, as an example, means in different uh, geographical contexts and also um, what affordances, capabilities um, different regions have. And those types of subtleties, I don't think you can see in an analysis like this, but, but it is being researched, I think. But there's also these huge power differences and in inequalities and uh, funding inequalities and infrastructural inequalities. And um, that is something that I think um, some of us are also addressing, but maybe I couldn't touch upon in, in uh, the analysis. Great. Um, Santo, yes. 
you wanted to come in. Yeah, I mean, how do, I mean, d d does the institutionalization dilemma challenge look, look different, Santo? Yeah, I mean, actually, I want to comment on both things. About this, uh, the uh, Aileen's question, uh, I mean, when I study, I don't know, for instance, citation network, I don't really cut anybody off, you know, just, you know, you have all the journals that you can study if you can, if you can build it and can analyze it, you know, uh, people making science in all, any part of the world are there. And the same thing for collaboration, you know, when I mean, I try to be as comprehensive as possible, I don't, you know, try to, uh, I mean, focus on, and of course, I mean, the bulk of the contribution comes from Europe and North America, because that's the way it is. But, uh, you know, when I try to look at, I don't know, for general properties, for instance, of a network uh, for, you know, uh, to make predictions, for instance, of the future evolution of, uh, I don't know, the number of citations in, uh, in you know, of a paper or, or an author. And uh, I don't really, uh, I really try to be comprehensive. And I think that's, I would say, that's what happens in many studies I'm aware of. When you study about things about mobility, of course, you know, again, there is a dominance of a certain part of the world, but, you know, everybody's part of this. Um, I don't really see it like a big problem in our era. Of course, I mean, uh, but I, I see the principle, right? When especially, you know, focus on, specific practices that could be it could be an issue but uh, it, it's not very really much of an issue in our case uh, the, the question of institutionalization is general i mean i've been engaged in uh, interdisciplinary endeavors for a long time and we all have the same problems the company the community of complex system the community of network science um, and uh, and the thing that i find kind of ironic is that i mean both when i was in europe and now that i'm here in the united states is that the funders usually say that they encourage interdisciplinary research, but then you're evaluated by most of the time panels of strongly disciplinary person. And you, there is no way you can make everybody happy because there is always the guy who say, oh, but this is not computer science strictly, or this is not entirely physics, or this is not, I don't know, sociology, or where is the sociolo sociological expertise? So I think this is really a structural problem against any type of interdisciplinary endeavor. Specifically in our case, but I would say in general, uh, you know, of course, departments are would be ideal, but I mean, I also share Aline's concern. I mean, I don't consider myself a meta scientist, you know, 100%. You know, I have my history background, I do other, many other things at the same time. Uh, but centers, I think, is a good uh, common ground. Centers recognize the presence of people that, uh, I mean, you know, can have members in different, in different departments. At least we represent the visible entities. You know, the very first steps, for instance, you know, in the development of network science was the existence of centers, uh, you know, within some of the universities, and then some of them even created the PhD programs. And uh, now there are even at least two departments I know uh, of network science, but it took 20 years. It's a very slow and painful process. Uh, uh, we need, of course, you know, I mean, uh, I don't want to leave my department or somehow, you know, I can also be in a different department. Somehow, I mean, I don't want to be so focused and, and that, in a way, is a very slow process because, you know, it engages with institutions. But, um, uh, you know, there are structural barriers that are difficult to overcome. You know, this is a slow process. What I would do, I would, you know, I would make it more visible with large initiatives, like, you know, large conference, which as many people as possible from different, uh, you know, perspectives come. And uh, I would see very favorably the formation of uh, creational centers in various places. Uh, there are, I think, a couple that I know. And, of course, you know, some, some of them have different names. Um, I think it could help. Great, thanks, Santana. Those are good points. Right, we've got three minutes left. Uh, we've answered most of the questions. A few of them are directed at specific panelists. We can perhaps do them by typing the answers. But just a final round, if I may, ask each of the panelists in sort of thirty seconds or less, if there was one thing uh, that they could do or see happen uh, to the field of meta science, however defined. Uh, to try and strengthen, improve, and push it in the kind of directions we've been talking about over the last 90 minutes. What would that one thing be? Um, Charlie, I'm going to pick on you first. Um, an infinite pile of money. Um, no, I think, I, I think, I think the, f the final question is, is a really good one. And, and I would, I would hang on that and say that broader, global diversity and institutional diversity within projects and programs and having power and resources behind those um, resources are very unequal in a lot of research they go in bias patterns to particular people uh, i think we'd be better off if a lot of those people gave those resources and that power to others who have less of a chance of getting it kind of naturally in the system we've created uh, so larger collaborations that are that are much more 
diffuse in, in how they distribute resources would be great. Great, thank you. Uh, keep them nice and punchy. Uh, Aileen, your your. Um, I think, and I know it's probably unfashionable to say at the point we're cutting back in our travel and we're doing online stuff right now. I think what I would like is more opportunities to meet some of you on this panel, some of you in this meeting and actually chat and get to know what it is we have in common, what our differences are, have those conversations or those arguments, whatever they're going to be. Because most of the things I go to are other historians or in this kind of venue, we're, we're having a bit of a conversation, but we could have so much more. So I guess I want someone to bring us together so that we can really have even more conversation and argument and um, controversy and what else. Excellent. No, I think we all, all second that. Thanks, uh, Amy, very much. Um, Santo. Oh, no, sorry. I, I just lowered my hand. So. Oh, OK, OK. No, uh, well, <laughs> Sara or Cassidy, any, any final single thought on? But I thought that I agree with Eileen. I mean, that, I mean, in the sense, I tried to say that earlier. I mean, we need more yeah, of yeah. these and ideally live and uh, to yeah. get a bunch, a bunch of funders over there, too. That, that's also very nice uh, about this occasion. So it's really, uh, and at some point, I guess I would add that that not only uh, like opening the doors to to our own interdisciplinary space, but also maybe open it even further to uh, to do transdisciplinary work with uh, and maybe collaborate with uh, with the people that that we're actually also trying to influence and uh, have impact on. And, and Cassidy, a final word. My 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 thirty second one. Um, collectively invest in doctoral students. I have I have gone to so many amazing doctoral forum in the last year or two for the Vermont Complex Systems Workshop, the CWTS, the Syracuse High School Summer School, and all of these doctoral students already embody all of these values. They want to use every tool, method, and theory available to them. They think they're curious. They are innovative. They are engaged. And we should do our best not to train that out of them. So I hope that we can continue to collectively invest in them and train them in the kind of future we want to see for the field. Excellent. Yes, another very good suggestion. Great. Well, thank you all very much. I think that's been a really a rich and, and productive and positive discussion. Uh, I, I mean, I think, you know, even looking at the, the meta science meetings, the two of them that there, there have been, you see in, in the progression in terms of the framing of the meeting and, and discussions like this, uh, also a, a you know steps forward in terms of, of facilitating and enabling these kind of important uh, uh foundational discussions and uh um I, certainly from from my perspective at, at rory would like to uh, um thank and, and pay tribute to brian nozek and colleagues at, at center for open science and our colleagues at amos as well for uh, the opportunity to bring together the people that we have even if only virtually for, for discussions like this uh the other one thing you can of course all do is join part two of this discussion, which will be taking place uh, on the 24th of September, or for some of you on the morning of the 25th, I think it's about midnight in, in the UK, so you'd have to be very committed to hammering out what MetaScience is to stay up till midnight to do it, but uh, uh, it will all be online. So Met MetaScience part two uh, will be moderated by uh, the wonderful Fiona Fiddler. Um, and there's another fantastic panel uh, and they have promised to uh, listen to and draw on our discussion. So we look forward to seeing them pick up some of those threads and no doubt add some of their own uh, as we move into part two. Uh, but we come to an end now uh, and let me just thank again uh, my fantastic panel. Um, Cassidy, Sarah, Santa, Charlie, Aileen, thank you very much. See you soon. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.